So I've had a, it was a little bit of an update on the, the past week. So uh, last weekend, I was able to uh, get away for a few days of just vacation. So we, we were at the uh, Cascades family camp outside of Yelm, where uh, at least this, this past summer, both of our daughters have also been serving there. So it's just fun to see them and uh, celebrate what God is doing in them. And then um, on Monday, I flew out to, uh, to Jackson, Michigan, and there's a, a, actually a picture here. I've started a, um, a doctoral program. This is my cohort, so I got a chance to meet with some of them at a place called Fosora's House. So over the next three years, doing a lot of study, actually under the lead mentor, he, uh, he is on second row, second person in. His name's Len Sweet. Um, feel free to look him up. He's written, I think at this point, about 100 books. He's a kind of a renowned global theologian, PhDs from a whole more places than I know. Um, but more importantly, he is an extremely interesting thinker about the future of the church. Asking questions about how do we reach the next generation? How do we live an authentic faith in an increasingly post-Christian world? So he's been forcing us to do a lot of study with, with um, biblical context and getting to know the first century really well, getting to know the situation of the early church really well. And um, so, so we'll be uh, doing a lot of study with him and then with that, with that group of people there working on a doctoral project over the next three years that actually going to have everything to do with, with God's work here. And I don't know exactly the parameters. There's... Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of steps involved. But, but everything in it is, has to do with what's on my heart, which is intergenerational ministry. Like, how do we pass on a robust and healthy faith to the next generation? Because to a certain degree, as I look around the culture around us, I'm not sure we're doing such a great job. And so, I want us to take a really good look at how do we equip the next generation to, to not just defend, but experience this, this life-changing faith, this life-changing relationship with Jesus. So um, I'm excited we get to go on that journey together. I think it's going to help all of us out. Um, and I'm, I'm excited for the journey that I'm on, and I'm, I'm hoping my brain doesn't explode, but if it does, no, actually, I don't think it will. I don't think it will. But, uh, but it's certainly getting filled up with some wonderful books and some wonderful teaching and uh, a really great team of people to be studying more deeply with, including all of you. And that actually brings us into the, what I wanted to do today. Uh, at least once a year, we try to do something that we just call a testimony service, like where we just tell stories of God's faithfulness, and here's why. See, in the early church, when, when um, I mean, Christianity was very much a marginalized faith, um, Christ, to become a Christian wouldn't gain you any social status at all. In fact, it would knock you back quite a ways. In that context, even in that context, the early church grew without buildings, without budgets. The more we get, to, I, the more I, I re learn about this, without hardly any missional strategy, without any deliberate evangelistic efforts, the early church grew. And within 350 years, this ragtag group of people from, this, from the armpit of the Roman Empire would be so prevalent and their social witness so clear that this little movement would quite literally take over the world. Now, not every part of that world takeover was good. We can talk about that. But it's fascinating. How did, this early, how did the early church survive? Well, I think it has everything to do with the, the same reason that the church is going to continue to, to survive and thrive in our time. And it's this, that when we encounter Jesus, we encounter hope. 
There is nothing, there is no one in history like Jesus. Amen. That's why the Apostle Peter, as he is writing to churches scattered throughout Asia, churches that he knows are starting to experience persecution, he gives them this instruction. This is what we're going to live out together today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 reads this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Be prepared. Doesn't mean you need to ram it down anybody's throat. Doesn't mean you need to be obnoxious for Jesus. But there is going to be a moment when you have your moment. And someone's going to go, what's up with you? And we want to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. So we're going to be training one another over the next few minutes together by giving some of our hope stories, like things that God has done in our life and things that we anchor our hope on. And I'm going to finish the verse. Thanks, tech team, for following me along. I'm a little bit excited today. It's like following and going on a walk with a Britney Spaniel. Here we go. So it says this, but do this. Paul, uh, Peter tells the church how to do it. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously about your good behavior in Christ, so they're going to, they're going to, pe people are going to talk down to you. They're not going to go, oh yeah, you're a Christ follower. But here's what they can't do. They can't deny the change in your life. That they, that they, even if they speak maliciously against your good behavior, they might be ashamed of their slander. So, I put the call out a few weeks back. If you have a God story to share, that today is going to be a day to share it. I know of a couple people who are already planning to do that. And I'm also trusting that the Holy Spirit has put an appointment on the hearts of others. And so we're going to do a little bit of the roaming mic thing. And we just pray for our tech team. They're going to try to follow me along. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do the best we can. Um, and I should say, if you're joining us online... Well, unfortunately, we don't have a way to just pipe your, pipe your video into the room. What we can do is if you've got a story to share, if you can summarize it in a sentence or two, we'll just post it up on the, post it up on the screen to read it together. So, um, yeah, our, 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 our amazing tech team will be watching our, our, uh, our, our online feeds, and we're going to encourage one another with the hope that we have in Christ. Because knowing Jesus changes everything. And living as a Christian, living as a Christ follower was never easy. It will probably be harder in the, in the years to come. And be ready. Be ready. Be ready to tell people about the hope that you have. Because the same hope that has changed your life can change their life too. So, let's help one another out. Now, um, Barb, uh, Barb told me in advance that she was going to share. Would you like to go first? I just love her. She, she is one of the most encouraging people on the planet. So, so Barb, would you tell us your God story? I am delighted to. Good morning. I greet you in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As most of you know, my husband, my beloved Ray, died five years ago. What you probably don't know is that I have always been afraid of the dark. When the sun goes down, I get a little apprehensive. So years ago, Ray's company required that he travel. And when he went on these business trips, he was gone for three weeks. They found it more profitable if they kept him there on the weekends rather than an airplane ticket to come home to his family. So it was a really, really long three weeks. And I would get the six children all tucked in, a, in bed at night. And then I would go out in the living room and I would place a chair in the middle of the room so I could monitor the front door and the back door. And I sat there all night, fully clothed, waiting for the boogeyman. <laughs> Next morning I would shower and prepare for the day and hope to catch a little cat nap along the line so I could do the same thing again the next night. After we had been married many years and the children were all gone and we were empty nesting, Ray would go on his beloved hunting and fishing trips. <laughs> and I would go down the hall and I would open just my side of the bed 
and I had a butcher knife and a phone on Ray's pillow. And I would lay there, fully clothed, waiting for the boogeyman. Well, Ray died unexpectedly in our home at 11 o'clock at night. By 3 o'clock that night, the first responders had all left. The coroner had come and gone. And the uh, mortuary had removed Ray's body. And as I collapsed in a chair, the Lord spoke to me. That very, very night, he spoke to me. And in a very soft and gentle, loving voice, he simply said, I've got you. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to tell you that I now can shower at night. I can get on my pajamas at 8 o'clock. <laughs> I watch a little TV, I go down the hall, I put my head on my pillow, and I sleep soundly. Amen. I need the Lord, I love the Lord, and I just want to praise Him all the days of my life, because He alone is worthy. Amen. Hey, before you go, Barb... Who, who here who here can relate to some part of Barb's story where, where God helped you overcome a fear or an anxiety? Yeah, just look around. Look around. That. Look around I the room. See that. Yeah, see? That's, yeah, that's, right. that's right. So that's let, me, let me pray for you. Okay? Lord, thank you that you are faithful even in the places where we are fearful. Thank you that you don't condemn us from our fear or for our fear. But Lord, you meet us in those places. And you give us hope, and you give us peace, and you give us courage. Lord, thank you that you have given Barb your courage. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So do be thinking about what you would like to, what if you would like to share. Um, I'd like to invite Donna, uh, Donna Shipper, to come up. Um, she's also... Uh, asked if she could share something about um, a God story that she's experienced. Okay. Well, I have a microphone, so we're even. There we go. You want me to hold it for you? Or you good to go? No, I got okay, it. You got this. All right. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, my story, the story I'm going to share today, um, began in 2002. I went through a divorce went back to college, got a degree in health information management, which is a pretty tech-driven field, and uh, my eyes were open to a whole new world. I loved everything about it. A college instructor saw management potential in me, and on my spring break of my last semester, I took a, a HIM director's position at a small hospital in Nebraska. I was very driven to be successful in my career, something I'd not experienced before. I'd been a stay-at-home mom homeschooling my kids. We moved quite a lot as I advanced in my career. And there were pros and cons about that. I think it was hard on the kids, but they were glad they didn't just live in Nebraska, that they got to experience some other areas of the United States and different cultures. Um, I've been fortunate to work as a director of HIM at hospitals from 600 beds to 25 beds. I've taught at two community colleges and I developed an HIM program for one of them. I traveled as a consultant for three years and brought in an, as an either an interim director or interim director and to fix a problem, which was usually the case. This is story is not about my success in my career, but it's about what happened in my career and how God stepped in. The road where warrior years, when I traveled as a consultant, it kind of wears on you quite a bit. I would be gone. Um, one of my gigs, I went from Spokane to New York um, to LaGuardia. I'd fly into LaGuardia, drive to Poughkeepsie. I'd fly that back and forth every two weeks. So um, I got to experience some different things and I really liked it, but I was ready to put away my luggage in 2016. I took a director's position in Colorado because I couldn't find a job in Washington that matched my qualifications. I worked at a small hospital in Salida, Colorado, which is right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains beautiful area. 
I began to think about retirement and asked myself what I really wanted to do job-wise towards the end of my career. I could take on more stress and responsibility as a regional director over several hospitals. But I decided for sticking with a small hospital and um, choosing quality of life. In the fall of 2018, I was contacted by a recruiter and they wanted to hire me as, or they wanted me to um, interview for a job in Delta, Colorado. And I really wasn't unhappy with where I was at. Um, I liked my job, I liked the location, but I never shied away from an opportunity if it was the right one. So I decided to um, throw in my application for the position, prayed about it, um, really was unsure. And so I set a salary range in my mind that they had to meet and it, for me to even consider going there, to give up something, a job I already liked. So I went and interviewed for the job. It went well. The man that I would report to was this um, chief financial officer, which was typically the case in my role. And he was a little different at the interview, but I thought, well, he's just shy, and he was. Um, they came back and offered me $10,000 above the amount that I set. And so I'm thinking, okay, Lord, here we go. <laughs> so I moved to Delta Colorado. Delta Colorado. Um, sorry, losing my place here. So I, like I said, I moved to Delta, Colorado, and at first things went really well. Unfortunately, this hospital was pretty much in the dark ages with technology, and the HIM department had been under poor management and a poor performing staff for years. In other words, I walked into a mess. I usually try to observe and watch and listen for about six months in a new role before I'd make any changes. When I started, I met with my boss and asked him if he would like to meet weekly or biweekly to get a departmental update, which is what I was used to in previous positions. He said, I don't care if we ever meet. Hmm. He said, my calendar's open. If you want to put something on it, you can. So I did. I scheduled meeting with him every three weeks. Um, I began to share ways that maybe we could make some improvement in processes and concerns about staff. And most of the time I met with him, he would have his side turned to me and he'd be on his computer and he'd glance over once in a while. Um, about a year into this position, we had a family crisis. And I'm always very open and honest, so I went to him and explained what was happening. I had a family member, member in rehab in Denver, and I could go on Sundays and spend a few hours with them on Sunday afternoon. And so we talked it over, and he agreed to let me do that. And so I would drive down Sunday morning, um, spend time with a family member, drive back, Monday morning, so I would come to work late on Mondays and um, make up my time. He seemed to be okay with that. But then things kind of changed. This only was, this was for a three month period. He started, it seemed like he was almost resentful. He would uh, be really snarky with me when I'd meet with him. He kept bringing up, you know, I was missing work, although I was a salaried employee. Uh, and it was difficult. He also began really undermining me. He would talk to my staff in the hallway and ask them, what's Donna doing? What's she working on? What are you guys doing? Instead of listening to me, he was uh, talking to the staff. The staff would come to me and say, I'm really uncomfortable with this. So I brought it up to him. I said, please, if you have a concern, come to me, talk to me. And um, that really never happened. He continued to just undermine me. It was a very uncomfortable position. But I decided to put my head down and stick with it um, and finish my career. But then COVID hit, <laughs> and this hospital was in trouble financially before COVID hit. And I found myself in uh, 2020, I got, called, uh, I got a call from HR and asked me to go down to my boss's office, and I was told that they were eliminating my position, which is really interesting because um, most hospitals are accredited by Medicare and CMS, and you have to have an HIM professional who's credentialed in order to get Medicare payments. So they didn't even have anybody that was credentialed. As you can imagine, I was devastated. I was absolutely devastated. Um, I spent, I went home and I just could not get enough time with God. 
I would get up in the morning and get my Bible and my cup of coffee. Dogs would jump in my lap. And I would sit there for hours reading his word, sitting in silence, just seeking God. I just couldn't understand what happened. One day I was cleaning the house, and about a month, month and a half in, and I had this word pop in my mind, hupomane. I'm thinking, well, that's weird. I knew I'd heard it in a sermon or a Bible study somewhere. Next day, same thing. It kept popping in my mind. Next day, same thing. kept popping in my mind. Finally, I thought, I'm going to sit down and look that word up and see what it means. <clears throat> I am going to let you hold this for a second. Yeah. Do you know the meaning of hupomane? Say it again. Hupomane. Hupomane. It's a Greek word in the New Testament. It means steadfastness, a patient, steadfast waiting. And I had felt like God wanted me to wait on him throughout that time. It was a long time. I waited seven months um, just continuing to pray and wait on him to provide a job. I, you know, I was worried, who's going to hire a 64-year-old woman? And jobs just locked down during COVID. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of movement to even find a career. I was so blessed that God would give me that word of encouragement. I mean, who am I that he would do that? And I don't know about you, but I don't have Greek and Hebrew words running around in my mind. I just don't. <laughs> So I was so blessed and encouraged, and I knew he wanted me to wait on him. And I was really, I started to pray for a job in Washington because I wanted to come back. And seven months in, he provided. He answered that prayer. Um, I, I was out of unemployment at that point. I was, my savings was gone. It was the 11th hour, but he came through. And I, I just want to, if anything today, I want to encourage you that he still speaks. He still moves. His love is deep and wide for you. So trust in him. Rely on him. Find some solitude and just spend time with him. And oh, I had a bracelet made with that word on it because it just is so meaningful to me. <laughs> yeah. So before, before you sit down, um, who here can relate to some part of that story where you, maybe you had a work challenge and everything was going wrong and then God just provided, just provided, just provided, exactly. Hupamane. 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 Lord, thank you for the ways that you demonstrated your faithfulness to Donna. Yes. Thank you, God, that, uh, that even in a difficult work environment, you reminded her that you're there with her, that, Lord, you provided, and, Lord, you continue to provide, and you continue to lead and guide. Thank you that you are sovereign even over our employment, even over our careers, that you are, you are that good, you are that capable. Lord, help us to trust you. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, oh, yeah. So who else has a, you, you may not have uh, four pages of notes, but that, that was super <laughs> impressive, by the way. Um, but, but if somebody was to ask you, so where do you find your hope? Like, why do you have hope? How would you answer? Oh, I know, which is, which is why I'm, I'm super <laughs> excited right now. <laughs> So Brittany, tell, tell us your God story or where you find hope. Okay, so um, a lot of you know me and I'm super nervous because I don't like to speak publicly. And I know a lot of you, so I don't really know why. <laughs> but okay, so my story is uh, 3 a.m. two years ago this week, actually, I got a call from my husband and um, he had passed out from a heart problem that he had. He had a atrial fibrillation that turned into ventricle tachycardia, which... Um, made him blunt, pump blood so fast that he didn't have any oxygen to his brain, so he passed out. That started a journey that many of you know about, um, a three-month journey of waiting for a heart transplant. So, at the time, I was a new mom of an eight-week-old baby and a three-year-old, and um, I was thrown into the world of waiting, waiting and waiting, and, God did a lot for me through that time. He provided, 
and provided and provided every turn of the way through a lot of you wonderful people that helped me in many, many ways through prayers and financial help and just support. Some of you even came and visited us at the hospital, took me on a walk to get me out of that place in the middle of COVID. It was a really rough time. Um, I almost didn't make it. Um, I was almost to the point where I was going to tell my husband, I can't be here anymore. I have to be with my kids. And that's when God sent the heart. <laughs> That's when we got the call that week. And it was, um, it was kind of amazing, actually. My sister had told me that morning that she had a dream, or that week that she had a dream that on Thursday, Brant was going to get his heart. Mm-hmm. Thursday at like 11, I got a call from Brant that he had gotten a call from his doctor that they found his heart. Wow. She did it prematurely. She shouldn't have told him that early because there was still tests mm-hmm. to run. But it was just a, a message from God that said... Mm-hmm. I know you are having a hard time, just hold on a little longer. And he got to come home Christmas Eve, and it was just beautiful. It was beautiful. God provides. He really does. He does. Before you sit down, who here, yeah, who here relates to some piece of that story? You've seen God provide medically. Seen God provide medically. Yeah. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to Brittany, to Brant, to their family. Thank you that you are a God who is also sovereign over medicine Mm -hmm. and healing. That you're a God who can take tragedy and turn it into beauty. Thank you for the beautiful heart that beats inside of Brant right now. And thank you that, that even the journey to that transplant is a reminder of your love for him, for Brittany, and for their entire family. Thank you that you are faithful. Amen. Amen. Who else has a story that they can, or a word that they can share? Could you, can be long, can be short? Yeah, Lana? Okay. Um, Where do you find hope, Lana? Jesus. Um, Mine's about protection. Um, I was thinking back when we were little, please don't anybody try these first two. Um, As kids, we would, run and jump and play and we'd be sweaty, we would go get in um, a deep freezer, shut the lid and cool off. (laughs) I mean, I get goosebumps even thinking about that. And then the other one was, um, we used to go down and this is when the old train station was Mm -hmm. here and we'd go where they couldn't see us. We used to jump on trains and ride them and jump off. We didn't until we got in trouble. Oh. But even that reminder that God meets us even in, in our foolishness. And I mean, yeah, yeah. He, he, he spares us sometimes could what, really, what could, have, uh, could have happened. Yeah. Just. Oh. And then everybody else here too, but we survived the 70s. I'm not going to go there. Yeah. We saw it in Jesus' revolution. But the latest thing that happened to me was my granddaughter and I were in Hawaii and on Wednesday was a huge storm. And so the waves were really churned up and we went to Waimanalo Beach, favorite beach. Mm -hmm. And I was in the water, even below my knees. I turned my back on the ocean and it grabbed me and it pulled me. Mm -hmm. And it pulled me and I thought, this is a terrible way to die. You know, that brief flash of your life before your eyes. And so Caitlin came and got me. I mean, it took a lot for her to pull me out. She goes, Grammy, what if I would have been sunning? And I mean, it was just, and I came out and um, she laughed at me. She goes, Grammy, you look like Kim Kardashian on the top, or Dolly Parton on the top and Kim Kardashian on the, Dashian on the bottom. I was so full of sand. <laughs> she goes, we can't go anywhere with you looking like that. <laughs> so, you know, um, I mean, it was. <laughs> I still think about it, and it's just like, and that poor people that when we returned the rental car, because they did it in the car, 
It's probably not the best idea, but I, you know. So I just think, yeah, the foolishness. Yeah. Been there. God is God has protected us. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to work to get that image all the way out of my mind. Okay, I'm just. It's going to take me a little bit. Whew, okay, who here can relate to that? Like God spared you from your own stupidity, and He is good. Yes, Amen. Now I've heard there is a there is a testimony, an on-screen testimony um, of of somebody. Can we put that one up? From Deb. From Deb. Okay. Okay. Well, well, let's put. Nope, that's not the one. But although I, yeah. When I was six years old, playing in the water, a wave took me out too deep, and I couldn't get back. I didn't know how to swim. After struggling, does anybody have the, can anybody pull up the rest? Oh, thanks, Brian. After struggling as long as I could, I knew I was dying. God was with me under the water as we had my life in review. All was so beautiful under the water, and I was fully at peace. The next thing I knew, I was on the shore, and my dad was pushing the water out of my lungs. No matter what happens, God is always with us, and truly all will be well. Amen. Amen. Let's hear from another person or two. Of a, yeah. So how have you seen God's faithfulness? Where's your hope? Many different ways. I uh, would like to tell a story. This, the first time I've been here, so this is a little nerve-wracking, but... God is with me and all of us who sit here and believe in him. When I was a young woman, I uh, started working in a bank. And this lady used to come in from local loan. I waited on her all the time. And um, in later years after I had my children, I was looking for another job. And I didn't go back to NBC or Rainier Bank. So I decided to try... Uh, I had had other jobs in between, but I went um, and applied for a job at North Central Credit Union. And um, my friend, who I had waited on for years, Betty Lucas, maybe some of you even knew her, um, put a word in for me because I'd known her and waited on her, and she, we kind of got this kinship going. And later on in life, after uh, we opened a new branch at the credit union on, uh, you know, you probably all know where it was. So anyway, um, uh, Betty got, she wasn't sick. She was going to retire. So she retired and probably, I think it was about a year after she retired, she died on mm -hmm. Christmas Day. So my husband and I, Ed Wiley, were standing in the cemetery at the funeral, and God's grace is helping me through this. <laughs> standing at the cemetery, and I'm, my insides, my heart is saying, Lord, why would you do this to her and her family on Christmas Day? For the rest of their lives, they're going to be feeling this missing mom and grandma. So my husband, after the funeral, we walked up by the um, place where they put all the ashes. Um, and my husband and I had been married for almost uh, 32 years. He was a high school sweetheart. <laughs> And all of a sudden, and I was, I was pretty upset. Ed had a hold of my hand. And all of a sudden, it was like, the only thing I can say, a whirlwind. It started at my feet. It went out the top of my head. And as it brushed up against my face, it was like a kiss. And it was cool air. And I said to Ed, I said, did you feel that? And I was just giddy. And he said, no, but I saw the leaf, because the leaf was doing this. Mm -hmm. Within probably f five years, my husband got cancer and died. And 
nobody has to be shown that there really is Jesus. But I was, I thank God for that gift he gave me because it got me through uh, the death of my husband. And to this day, I still believe in him. I believed him in all, all the whole time. And people would say, have you been praying? How about all day? How about talking to Jesus all day when you have a problem? Or to thank him for the blessings he's giving you. John 3:16. Those that believe in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's not word for word. I'm not very good at remembering things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God bless before all you, of you. Before you sit down, who, who can relate to where, where God just met you in a time of grief, and he helped you get through the loss of someone that was close to you? Yeah. He's there for all of us. He is. Can Thank I pray you. for you? Yes. Lord, thanks for Jonna and her story. And God, we pray that you... Well, this thank you, God, that you meet us even in those places of grief and in those places of loss. And Lord, thank you that you give us hope and you give us strength. And Lord, I thank you that you've done that for her. You are good. You are faithful. Amen. You are loving. And we thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So we've got time for one more story. Josh, is, do, you, do you have a oh, I, I, he's, he's jumping up and down in the back. He's got to share a story. Okay. So, Josh, where, where do you find, how, how, do you, how have you found hope? I have found hope. As, as many of you guys know, I can relate to her testimony. It will be 23 years ago this december 14th that i have lost my mom my biological mom and through all that i have found god's hope in everything i do and don't each and every one of you guys don't think that god's not there don't think that God's not on your right side. Mm -hmm. Don't think that he doesn't have your back, because he does. God is amazing. God has done a lot in my life. I shouldn't be here like right now, but I am. Mm -hmm. I am a miracle. All of you guys are one big miracle. Mm -hmm. And all I have to say is, I love you guys. Thanks, guys. So there's a lot of people in the room, under, like that sense of God, is, God gave us family and God gave us strength, even in the midst of, of loss. And, and we're grateful to know you, Josh. We're grateful to know you. Just as we, as we, I mean, more than anything, what I hoped this time this morning would be is just a, a chance for us to kind of practice sharing our hope. So um, maybe just before we close, if you're sitting next to somebody and you, can, you could summarize your hope in a word or a short phrase, like God brought me through grief, God provided me, God, God, brought, God spared me from an accident, or God provided for me in my, in, where'd you go, in my, in my work, um, would you just take a moment and just share that phrase with the person next to you, just so we can, we can, be, just like the scripture says, we can be ready. We can always be ready to give a reason for the hope within us. So take just a moment and do that. <laughs> 